Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 753rd New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, a programs associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation and reading featuring Charles Alexander, Cynthia Miller, David Abel, and Cole Swenson. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we are speaking from. I am now to introduce today's guests and host. Charles Alexander is an artist, poet, bookmaker, professor, and founder and director of Shax Press. He's the author of six books of poetry, 13 chapbooks, and multiple essays and reviews. Alexander has taught literature and writing at Naropa University, University of Arizona, and elsewhere. He's the recipient of the Arizona Arts Award, among other recognitions. Cynthia E. Miller is a visual artist. She lives, works, and teaches painting and writing in the desert Southwest. She enjoys collaborations with other artists and writers from Chax Press Poetry and Publications, OTO Dance, and many others. Writer and editor David Abel is the proprietor of Passages Bookshop in Portland, Oregon, a founding member of the Spare Room Reading Series, the co-founder of 13 Hats, and a member of the Four Wall Cinema Collective. His recent publications include the chapbook Equifinality and the first volume of an ongoing hybrid genre work entitled Sweep is forthcoming from Chax Press. And our host today, Cole Swenson, is the author of 17 volumes of poetry and a collection of critical essays called Noise That Stays Noise. A former Guggenheim Fellow, she has been a finalist for the National Book Award and has been awarded the Iowa Poetry Prize, among other recognitions. She's also translated over 20 volumes of poetry, prose, and art criticism from French, and has won the 2004 Penn USA Award in Literary Translation. I am so thrilled to have you all here today to discuss Chax Press, and I'm going to pass it over to you, Cole. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm, we're really thrilled to have Tax Press tonight, today. I'm in <clears throat> France, so it's tonight, but sorry about that. Um, and particularly because it gives us a chance to explore the intersection between the verbal and the visual. Uh, the various people, all three, have connections to visual poetry, painting, concrete poetry, letterpress printing, book arts, artist books, et cetera. So we'll be able to uh, really explore the, the material nature of poetry in our conversation. So we're gonna start as we always do with poetry. We'll hear from David Abel and Cynthia Miller, and then we'll have a conversation for 45 minutes or so, then a Q and A, and then Charles Alexander will finish the session for us with some poetry. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to David. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cole, and welcome everyone. I'm going to read um, just a few excerpts from this first volume of an ongoing long hybrid work called Sweep, which is forthcoming from Chax Press. This uh, is a project that I began 18 years ago and uh, includes uh, poems, fragments, prose, quotations. Uh, it's part commonplace book, part uh, journal, and uh, part uh, sort of a poem workshop. And uh, I'm going to begin just at the beginning. Uh, and it's uh, the sections are numbered. And as soon as I get to the next page, this is sweep. After the shortest day of the year, walking in the longest night with Mark, a glass of wine at Noble Rot, his neighborhood, it could be mine as well. 
Tomorrow, he and Maria fly to Ohio. Despite his troubles, he finds interest and concern to listen to me, to ask me about Hudit and where things stand. It was midnight when we parted. Make the days count, count the days. What is left to me to do and so to be. Somehow I too must come to make things, not plastic, but written things, realities that emerge from handwork. Somehow I too must discover the smallest basic element, the cell of my art, the tangible immaterial means of representation for everything. Found poems, process poems, cross genre works, performances and collaborations, the textures unfamiliar or most familiar of lived experience. Day awake. Two, a day within a day or a day and a night within a night, the reading of Midwinter Day at Chris's house this evening, three readers, a dozen people in all. Through the window looking east, the giant milk carton revolving atop the dairy across the street, 22,000 times a day, 8 million times a year. How much milk could it hold? Would it make butter? The candor and ambition of Bernadette's poem, its poignant rhapsody. Pandit Pranath's invocation of Rag Todi, the Gramavision recording on the turntable now, a wild but irresistible comparison. Three, eyes tired, body spasmodic, ineloquent at dinner, ecstatic and frenetic at lunch, gifts hidden under the doormat. Finally, it's my birthday again, five weeks later. Wine, sugar, coffee, fat, salt, starch, oil, spice, orange, bergamot, mint, hyssop. I won't find my voice preserved in the branches of the borrowed trees at the Japanese garden, but I have to go to begin to begin how many more times? Four. It is shocking how day after day, naked acts of violence, breaches of the law, barbaric opinions appear quite undisguised as official decree. Eight, retail for the urban generation, mirror marketing selling us to ourselves. Kiev, DC, Georgi Pushakovich. Forget red and blue, it's all orange now. Lost days pass over them in silence. Vectors of desperation, grains of sand, bricks, breaths, steps, miles, gallons, paper clips. 11, New Year's Eve, a passage anchored at the bottom of the calendar. At dinner tonight with other friends of Steve's who live here now, I told the story of my near drowning in the Salmon River. I too easily forget what my life depends on, countless threads from which everything I am is suspended. None of them alone could sustain a teaspoon, but together they hold my whole life. 12. Unseen rain. I fear your love, your cruelty, your anger, which call out my own. To be a lover, must I be the tyrant who rules my days alone? 15. The day's beauty aches, post tsunami, the war unabates. I don't remember Portland winter ever reminding me of faulty memory. No sight of the moon last night, but Sunday night's waning moon as it rose regarding the earth, the color of shattered lives. 
So that's a little sample of the opening of this book sweep. And I think now Cynthia is going to continue. Thank you, David. That was really, really wonderful. I'm going to look forward to that um, that book. When is Jax publishing it? Should, can I ask? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I'll get a close look then. Um, I've always been interested in the the choices between writing and painting. I started off writing poems as a child, and then moved into painting because the writers at the university were so nuts, right? I thought the painting department would be more sane, right? So mm, fool that I was. So I go back and forth and back and forth. And I um, I, I just want to say some things about um, painters and poets. Um, you know, elephants can hear like 40 miles out, but I think painters and poets hear thousands of years out and they talk back, okay? All right. A drawing is like a hoop. It is a thing and a place at the same time. With your mind, you must go through it to where you no longer see it. I love the spare poems, elegant to the bone, free falling, lifting from shape to cloud. While painting coats the surface, summons forms that harden and go still, takes a mind to wiggle them loose again to make a map of meaning. I call my painting the sun and the moon and the heavenly bamboo. Young hawk sits below her nest in pine branches and pine limbs within the splayed fingers of pine needles and cones. Sun rising, southern moon setting together across a pale sky. We have been awake for hours called Beyond the House's Edge. Okay. Um, sometimes the paintings come and then the poems come. Sometimes it's the other way around. Anyway, uh, one of my students who um, passed this last April um, when she was 89 years old um, was a very, very, became a very, very good friend of mine. And so I wrote her this poem for Marsha Hirsch. Let there be zucchini bread, let there be brisket. Can I make you a coffee strong like Sid likes? Can I make you a friend? Let there be cookies, all kinds and delicious to go with our coffee, our white wine, our story. Can I paint you a teapot, red flowers, an elephant? Let there be music, sweet peas in the garden, spring flowers and hummingbirds, small dogs to love. Let there be beauty with a capital B. Let there be friendships, both strong and surprising. Let there be dear hearts to laugh with forever. Um, in the early days of COVID, when Charles and I were sitting around, we, we joined a Soto Zen group, you know, might as well, right? So I, begot, I became, as I've always been interested in Buddhism, but even more interested. So it started to enter into writing. Um, this is for Robert Thurman, who's a um, Eastern religious scholar at Columbia for years and years, mostly in the Tibetan Buddhist era. I wish Bob Thurman would come over to dinner, tell me what to do with my infinite life, and my fennel. How's Uma, I'd say. We have an Irish whiskey and a Tibetan prayer over cow cheddar cheese on club crackers, multigrain. And you? He'd ask about my day and why I'm crying. I'm tired, I say, of saying goodbye, hello, goodbye, hello. How it goes and goes like Peloton, the infin infinity bike of breath and legs without journey. Oh, oh. Maybe Bob would find a joke, some Buddha story we can both laugh at, really laugh like the one about screwing up so much you have to come back many times as a four-legged, short-lived mammal. How do we see the sunset from here, Bob? All the houses and city in the way. The earth tilts and we hang on, lose our minds a little to all the beauty. Tell me, Bob, are you tired? I can read Norman's poems to you. I can read Phil Whalen or Nanao. Put these crackers in your shirt for later. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, this next little poem is uh, for those who stand uh, by the streets with their little signs, you know, um, and it's called Instructions. Holding your hand one inside the other like a bowl, say, fill my bowl with kindness, fill my bowl with patience, fill my bowl with understanding, fill my bowl with beauty, fill my bowl with friendship, with sunlight, with moon, fill my bowl with gratitude, fill my bowl with animals, with flowers, with bird song, fill my bowl with poetry, fill my bowl with earth, fill my bowl with music, with painting, with dancing, fill my bowl with children, fill my bowl with pine trees, fill my bowl with orange blossoms, fill my bowl with laughter say, fill my bowl with kindness. Okay. Um, I, have, I have another Buddhist poem and I have to say apologies um, to Dogen who brought, of course, if I can find it, um, poetry, um, who brought, who brought um, Soto Zen um, to Japan. It's called Dogenets. Um, in our sangha, once it was all women, and someone referred to the all the women as doganets, like the ronettes from like the 50s or something, the singing groups with the hand motions and stuff. So I got thinking about doganets, and I immediately went to raisinets, you know, because that's how my brain works. So this is uh, doganets. My life is a movie watching from my seat. Got to go to, to the Zen bar, get something to eat. Doganets for me, for a subtle body too, taste like nothing thought free. I'll share them with you. Okay. That's my, <laughs> I thought I'm funny, but thank you. Thank you very much for putting up with my poetry. I hope you like the paintings better. <laughs> No, wonderful to hear, and, and just a great way to get the hour started. So thank you, thank <laughs> you very much. Um, and to start the conversation, I would just love to hear about the journey that Chax Press has taken. It's an uncommonly itinerary or itinerant press. And so I thought it'd be fun to talk about that itinerary. In 40 years, you've gone to several cities. And I was also thinking that that itinerant nature, that incredible range, is also echoed in the things you publish, from Tracy Morris to Helen Sanguinetti to it's just all over the place. And so um, I don't know if there's a connection there, but tell us about the journey that Jack's Press has taken. Yeah, it sounds like my mind is itinerant. <laughs> it, it's funny because you, you, I get that question, um, the different places. I also remember before I ever started Chax Press, uh, the, the writer um, Paul Metcalf uh, told me, you know, one piece of advice to a press was never move. <laughs> so obviously advice I did not follow. And Chax Press was born in a move. You know, I moved from Madison, Wisconsin to Tucson, and I had a printing press in a basically U-Haul trailer parked it in Tucson at the home of Leslie Marmon Silco, the Native American novelist, who was the only person I knew here at the time. And that was the beginning. Uh, that said, though, you know, we're, we are approaching 40 years. We'll hit that in 2024. Um, and yet 33 of those years are in Tucson, Arizona. So it, it's certainly clear to me this is our place and has been our place and was always the place to come back to. Uh, but we did have, uh, you know, a three year period in the mid 1990s when uh, I was invited to direct the Minnesota Center for Book Arts in Minneapolis. And, and I did that for that period. And I think uh, uh, I kind of wanted to get back more to just making books myself. So that ended. And then uh, we had a period more recently, 2014 to 2018, 
where both Cynthia and myself accepted uh, faculty positions at the University of Houston, Victoria, in Victoria, Texas, which was at the time building itself as a kind of publishing center with other presses there, like Dalkey Archive Press and Cuneiform Press. I think Fiction Collective too was there for a while. So there was a hub of activity. Um, but things changed in our lives and also in that university's life. Uh, you know, not all things in universities have been improving for the better in recent years. So I'll, I'll only say that much. But uh, we came back here in 2018, you know, and probably would have set up within a couple of years in a in a studio in Tucson. But because of COVID and everything, uh, when we started making those plans, we ended up staying here in our house and working. So this has been uh, actually the unusual period for us of not having a uh, big warehouse space to spread our wings a little bit. Within Tucson, we've been, we were a little itinerant. I think we've, I've been five different spaces here. Although the first of those was set a series of moves to, you know, as artists do with their studios, a better space and a better space. And, and that leads me to also say that getting back to the verbal and the visual as a topic to talk about here that I began bookmaking in a community of artists studying typography, paper making in the book arts at the University of Wisconsin um, under the you know more or less mentorship of Walter Hamady, who is a very known um, artist and bookmaker of the gosh, I guess 1970s till 2000 or so. And, uh, and then when I moved to Tucson, because I had the press, needed physical space, I ended up in, you know, warehouse studio space. So my first community here was the artists it, who were literally my studio mates or building mates. And, and of course, Cynthia being prime among them. <laughs> and, and uh, so that was always a part of who we talked to and, wh and what it was uh, about and, um, and, and a fascinating part. So I don't know if that explains everything about itinerancy. Who knows, will we move ever again or not? I don't know. Uh, and I believe Cynthia and you Charles have actually shared studio space at times. So there's a, Real overlap. Yeah, she might talk about that. <laughs> uh, we, we seem to be able to do that. I don't think all married couples can do this. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone particularly, but I think because we have such specific interests and uh, I have tremendous respect for what Charles has done and his, his sense of uh, space in the books and his, his design. Um, his selection of the poets. I mean, I can't complain, right? Um, this is something that when I went to school in San Francisco, I was at the now closed Art Institute. I think it's part of San Francisco State or it will be, but I went to the San Francisco Art Institute. And when I left, left there and came back to Tucson, I said, I'm gonna get involved with a small press, not knowing, and Charles wasn't there yet. This was 70, nine, I think I came back. So 78. So, you know, it's just funny. Be careful what you say, how you plan. Mm -hmm. um, but we've been able to share space and actually uh, really support each other in that endeavor. It's been great. It's been great. And, and David, am I remembering correctly that the first Passages bookstore was also in Tucson? No, I've I've never been in Tucson. I uh, I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, okay. uh, and and it was um, in in between my first shop in New York, which was called the Bridge Bookshop in the late '80s, which is where I met Charles. Mm -hmm. So worth mentioning for that reason, and being here now on the West Coast in in uh, Portland, and um, that time that I was in Albuquerque was the time that. Charles and Cynthia and I were fit geographically most proximate 
So I think of that as the kind of a waste of a of a uh, w a i s t <laughs> the, the the of a of a sort of hourglass where initially we were separated by most of the country and then then uh, for about five years while I was in Albuquerque it was a, a lot easier to be together in person and um, and for me to get a, a really more vivid sense of what Chax was doing and to participate um, when I was able to get down to Tucson. And um, when uh, I wanted to make one little uh, footnote, uh, add one little footnote about Walter Hamady, who was the presiding uh, spirit in some senses at Madison, whether you were his student or not um, directly, is that uh, Walter uh, was one of a very small handful of people involved in the revival of fine printing in this country who cared about contemporary writing. So instead of printing, you know, the umpteenth version of King Lear or whatever, uh, uh, Walter was publishing important uh, non-mainstream contemporary poets. And, and most of that, or a lot of that was due to his friendship with Paul Blackburn. And uh, so maybe Blackburn and and his company are also presiding spirits in a way of what Walter was about, and maybe what the many many presses and publishers who came through Madison and uh, through Walter's tutelage. So great, thank you for that history and tying us down to that revival of letterpress and fine printing in this country. That's really, and in fact, I think you've got some images that there's a, a PowerPoint that shows uh, some of this connection to um, hand making or uh, letterpress making books. So, and, and give us commentary. Tell us what we're looking at when you get a moment. Oh, you're looking at, at, at almost as soon as I moved to Tucson, somebody got a whiff of my being here and did a little article in the newspaper and that picture was there and and so I think Cynthia saw that picture and then <laughs> wanted to meet me or something. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Cynthia did see that picture. And I said, I want a man to look at me the way this guy looks at his press. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, this is a Vandercook printing press. Uh, you see a little book pr press behind it that's used in book binding. Uh, I'm holding, uh, looks like a piece of leading and I'm wondering if I need to place it among those letters that I'm looking at on the press. Um, and this was, uh, I did, this was a lot of my daily work, you know, in the, from probably 19, even before I moved here from 1981 or so until 1989 or so. And one of the things we did besides print books was print uh broadsides uh sometimes just because we wanted to and sometimes for poetry reading this seeds press part of the community of and hopefully have helped to foster in that lenhagenian was one of many uh poets giving a reading at a terrific uh, bookstore and literary center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Woodland Pattern Book Center. And I did that broadside by her. And then this is a book by Kit Robinson and Lynn, which I published here in Tucson in fairly early days. And this is a hand bound book as well as being letterpress printed. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Although it probably isn't bound in a way that most bookbinders think of traditional book bindings, but you know, it's the it's got a sort of an accordion center that pages are attached to, and that's something important about checks. We always try to design books from the inside out. You know, like what's this what's this poetry doing? And these poems were by uh, Lynn and Kit, and they were written individually in correspondence with each other. So we wanted to preserve that sense of individuals, which is the title of the book. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, <laughs> this is all a lot of fun. When uh, Mary Baraka came to Tucson for the Tucson Book 
Tucson Poetry Festival, of which I had, had been directing and sent me uh, this piece to print as a broadside. And I remember when he when I handed it to him, when he came to Tucson, he said, I never thought you'd actually print that. <laughs> but uh, the involvement with other organizations in Tucson was part of that community building too. And I'm grateful to an active community and there's still an active community here. Tell us. Uh, we're this now between these hand done and limited edition to now things that are trade editions. Uh, do you want to tell us about making that shift? Had you always been doing trade editions as well? If you go back one slide, those four books were the first trade books. And um, I had been sent these manuscripts by Beverly Dolan, Ron Silliman. Uh, I'd always wanted to do a book by B.P. Nichol, the Canadian poet, um, and these really were of a size, you know, a couple of hundred pages or more than that, that needed, uh, the letterpress would have been very difficult, not impossible, very difficult, but also that seemed to call for a kind of distribution that I, what just wasn't going to be possible with smaller letterpress editions. So this was uh the beginning of that and then i remember charles bernstein in one of these periods around this told me uh, of my work he said you need a book and it takes too long to get someone else to publish it so you should publish it and so i did that for my first book hopeful buildings and uh and, and that was uh, very nice all kinds of showings of books over the years at book book festivals uh, AWP conferences, there's Trace Peterson and Tracy Morris, I guess that's the, the Trace and Tracy photo. Mm -hmm. Will Alexander, who um, has been a friend for the duration, I think he and I both started publishing our poetry at about the same time, and but it, it took several years, I think, till we were maybe at teaching at Naropa together once at Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado, where we uh, bonded and published a couple books by Will and have invited him to give readings everywhere I've been. <laughs> just a picture, this is not a letterpress book. I just laid those books out uh, by Leonard Schwartz and Simon Carr on a press to photograph them in this way. You know, part of our years in Texas, poetry readings there with paintings of Cynthia in the on the walls. This is a, a space that was our shared studio space as well, but also the space in which we taught classes here. If you go back one, one slide, the image on the wall behind these two Texas poets is the cover of Demo to Ink, Ron Solomon's book. And it's nine feet long and could not have been made if I hadn't met Charles and made this in his studio. I didn't have a table big enough. Thank you. This is uh, teaching at Naropa University in the print shop there, uh, which has been something I seem to have done every three or so years for the last 20 years, maybe. So. And just needles and threads, needles and threads. How do you make a book? Paper, needles and threads. It's about all you need, really. And this, this image? This is vessels. Um, this is a mural that I commissioned myself to do when business got too slow. And it's 20 feet long and it's four feet high. And they're all um, vessels that exist or don't exist. And it's a, kind of a marriage between painting and drawing. And, and, and is it oil on it's canvas? Like acrylic with chalk pastels and oil paint sticks and, on, and graphite on paper. And part of it became the cover for a book of mine that was published by uh, Little Red Leaves Textile Editions. Great. Us in the desert, you got to get out there. <laughs> And, and then we just put some uh, book covers together. 
particularly with Cynthia's art on them. So you see that conjunction in the trade books. I think of the trade books exterior and interior being designed out of the same mindset that the letterpress books are. Um, thinking about that space of the page, that relation of words and look, and I'm thinking about the field. And um, it just takes a different way. I had, to, I had to learn to use computers, certainly. <laughs> And that also is your piece, Cynthia, is that right? Yes, yeah. I became known as the chair lady for a while. I did a lot of these chairs, big ones and little ones. This one my daughter has who lives, our daughter has who lives in Washington, DC. It's her chair. Great. Great. We've always done chap books as well as full length books. And this is one of those, you can see where it's sewn on one edge um and uh and i this was the first work we published by david abel and this the next hmm. we've done i think four or five books including anthologies he's edited and uh, by the vietnamese american poet lin din and this is the that was the one that had Cynthia's work on it on the cover of it. Another chapbook, a different kind of work, uh, the art on the cover. Yeah, it looks like a um, rubber stamp. We had stamps made of drawings. Yes, yeah. Okay. Good eye, Cole. <laughs> And another one of the books, that last one that was um, not published by Chax, but included both Cynthia's work on the cover and, and a book by me. That was published by uh, Singing Horse Press, and it was accepted by Gil Ott, who was absolutely a part of my community and my heart, uh, oh, but yeah. he passed away. And so it ended up being published by Singing Horse Press when it was directed by Paul Naylor. I wanted to just note that um, one of the characteristics of the trade books, as well as the handmade books of Chax, is, is they are non-uniform. And that specificity, the, the individual uh, solution to the design in every case, the format, the size, the proportions, is indicative of the variety and, and uh, range and specificity of the contents as well. Yeah, what Charles had mentioned is working from the inside out. This really shows right. when you see the actual books. Sometimes I try that six inch by nine inch book or five and a half by eight and a half, but it often just doesn't work for the material there. Yeah. And what's this? Tell us about this. These, these are recent cutouts. Um, I'm sort of addicted to drawing with scissors. If you haven't done it, do it because it's so much fun. So I painted a bunch of paper red and I also have an obsession with pomegranates. We grow them, we make jelly, we make martinis. Um, it's just it's such a beautiful, you know, an, an ancient fruit, right? Maybe it wasn't an apple in Eden and maybe it was a pomegranate. So anyway, the, I just kept going with these pomegranate images. They're not big. They're about maybe four inches by three inches, something like that. But I wanted to include them because they're so, I had so much fun. Great. And Chax Press has put these images to work in announcements, in fundraising requests, because we have to do that to survive too, and in other ways. And, you know, it's just like, I just think of all those seeds, you know, those pomegranates, it's all, you know, part of, I don't know, thing, thinking of how things cohere. Yeah. Community. Yeah. yeah. They're wonderful. Thank you. And this? This is, this is a re very recent painting and it's, um, some of my favorite flowers that were kind of starting to die, but there's St. John's wort 
um, a chrysanthemum, a carnation, and some little mini roses that were starting to wilt. And I, I just love the, the kind of balance in this and that yellow flare. I don't know how that even happened exactly. Um, I just experiment a lot and see what happens. And um, I really like what happened in this painting. Yeah. Well, given the context, it reminds me of the gutter of a book. Mm -hmm. Fine, because I can see that there's something slightly raised, uh, maybe a little dimensionality there. I think my impulse in painting is very much what poets do. Like it's greater than the sum of the parts. You know that that saying. Um, I want something that is greater than what's actually what you actually see, the feeling of it. Yeah. <laughs> This is a little triptych. These are on small canvases, like eight by 10. And it's um, my father, we're living in the house that I kind of grew up in since I was 10 and my parents have passed. And anyway, th these are this is a tree my father planted, an orange tree. And as it was coming into fruit, I decided I'd take some photos and make this little triptych. And um, it's, not, it's not an ordinary painting for me because I'm not realistic. You might've noticed, but I'm not particularly realistic. So I was very thrilled with the way this came out because it feels it feels like a tribute to him. Nice. And this, this is, is the current, current location of passages in Portland. Mm -hmm. Great. 18, 1895 warehouse building. Mm -hmm. I love the wooden beams and pillars. It, as a really I think it's the only space in the building left where the beams haven't been painted. So I'm very happy to discover this space a little over a year ago. It's my seventh location, but I think it's finally what I what I want. So talk about itinerants. <laughs> Some Jack's Press books on display in the shop. Nice. Great. Well, thank you. The, that tour was just marvelous. And I think it's just so rich for the eyes to see and to see this blend of the book structure and the painting structure and just how well you all have made it go together. Um, and David, I'd like to ask you a little bit because I know that your sort of concrete experience has been extensive from concrete poetry to a lot of work with typography to, I believe you were working with Steve Clay at Granary Books also for a while. And so a lot of tactility, a lot of materiality. And I would love to hear about that experience and how you feel like it might be informing your poetic work. Well, uh, it, it certainly is a, um, an area or an arena of overlap of interest with Charles and Cynthia. Um, when uh, Charles came to uh, New York in 1988, I think it was, um, and came to my shop then, the Bridge Bookshop, um, I think our first connection was around BP Nickel. And uh, Nickel is an example of, you know, as a sort of restless, a uh, mind that wants all of the possible ways of of interacting with words and with other people through words uh, visual and performative and sound and um, early com er, early computer animated poetry that he did that is in formats that have had to be sort of translated to be able to be uh, seen now. But uh, I I fell into just by chance I fell into advertising typography in New York when I was in my early 20s and it was before desktop publishing and it was a very not only a very good trade I mean I think I reached my earnings lifetime earnings peak at the age of about 26 but um, it was also a, a, a sort of mysterious world I, I worked where letters were born it was a very wonderful thing to to, to do and it sensitized me I think obviously I must have already had a, a proclivity, but it sensitized me to the both the visual appearance of letters 
individual letters and how they come together, but also the these processes, these extraordinary processes, which were changing very rapidly. I, I worked in that field in a time when, when the technology changed constantly. And um, a cold type um, photographic uh, type was coming in and then it was very quickly replaced by computer type and digital. Anyway, so um, I think that when I finally decided that I had to open a bookshop because I couldn't literally get across my apartment in New York um, because of all the books and the boxes, um, I, I, was, uh, I was interested in the tactility, the materiality of the books. And, and that also then predisposed me towards uh, experimental work, even if it wasn't explicitly concerned, say, with that visual area, the, the, the notion of, of an exploratory aesthetic. And so, for instance, in that little tiny, I mean, it was a very tiny space in the East Village, the first thing when you came in the door, the first bookcase was every Sun and Moon book. It, at that time, uh, it was still quite new. And um, uh, so when Charles and I met, I think that was, a, that was we found a common commonality right away. Uh, I then also met people who were making books by hand in New York. And I met Steve Clay. He walked into... Uh, the Bridge Bookshop, and it reminded him very much of the little bookshop he had begun in Origin Books in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, before Granary existed. And um, so we connected over that shared sense of an interest in small press poetry and visual art and things like that. And when I decided to close my store, he said, well, come, come to work for me. So I helped him move to New York and get set up. And the first year and a half of Granary in New York was just Steve and I. And um, we were in a couple of different locations in Soho during that time. And we're very much a bookstore and a gallery as well as publishing. Uh, Steve was just beginning to move into publishing visual books and experimental books. The first two Granary books were literary fine printing, one of which was co-published with Chax, right? The Firebird, Paul Metcalf. And um, so those first granary books were, were very literary. Uh, not, not that he stopped uh, being a very uh, deeply involved in the literary, but he began to be interested in experimental and visual books and to publish them and to, to promote them and to sell them. Um, around the same time, I married a book artist and a master printer who coincidentally, not coincidentally, was the person who Charles always said taught him how to print letterpress, right. Catherine Keene, uh, who had been at Madison and not only had been a student with Walter Hamity, but worked at the Perishable Press for many years, making paper, binding books, printing, et cetera. So that was, he had a, I mean, that was really how Charles and I met was through Kathy. Um, and so in a sense, our meeting was, uh, thanks to Walter Hamity and thanks to letterpress printing and handmade books. Right. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit of uh, uh, the way in which that, that range of interests turns into community and connection. Um, and one of your most recent books, I believe, is Concrete Poetry. It, it, well, it's, it's what I, it's, it's, I, it's a visual narrative. Uh, or I think of it as a visual narrative. The 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 pieces are I call them glyphs, um, and um, it was originally done as just a laser printed book by uh, James Yeary's Press here in Portland, CL. But then Red Fox Press, which is in Ireland, which focuses almost exclusively on collage, visual poetry, uh, fluxus uh, related things, and they. Re reprinted it in their series, Say Mon Dada. And um, I, it's had a number of forms, which in a way it's a really good project to uh, exemplify my, my own restlessness, which is that it's been um, a book in a couple of different formats. It's been a slideshow and performance with improvised text. And I hope that it will also eventually be a portfolio of prints 
And the, the idea that a project can have multiple lives in different formats and different physical realizations, I, 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 I'm really a, a sort of frustrated composer, a wannabe composer. And so the idea that you have realization as this step in a process that uh, I'm always looking for different modes of realization of, of what might be poems or texts or books or projects. So, anyway. That's I, really I, I can say that too about, you know, the way I think of books, different modes of realization. And in, in fact, I, I, if I see anything for the future, it's to um, do some more letterpress projects again and and other kinds of projects that realize the book in different ways whether that's public ways whether that's uh generated ways uh using artificial intelligence or whatever but uh just keep on pushing at those possibilities so that also um brings up the notion of technological change, which David, you touched on. And I'm thinking about community, which many, it seems central to everything that you do and thinking about the things that Chax does with YouTube. And so I'm, I'm how, how does letterpress, you know, go together with YouTube? I love the idea that these live in the same house. And I'm thinking of how much, uh, your YouTube channel channels others and extends that community. And I, I'd love to hear the range of projects that you're doing with that. Well, you make me think that I better do a letterpress book and put in on YouTube somehow, <laughs> how, how that would be done. I'm not sure, but we, um, you know, Cynthia and I have both been involved with a long-term reading series here. And of course, when, COVID happened, everything pivoted to online and, and we started, you know, broadcasting and recording the readings. Uh, I think in earlier years, we just made sound recordings of readings, but we started making video recordings and didn't seem like those should just have a life of being sent out to a few people. So uh, we started the YouTube channel and not long after we did in 2020, I suppose, um, people liked what they saw there and we started getting requests from, um, you know, Ray Armentrout and Jean Huving, who had started this enclave reading series uh, with many prominent, I think, innovative poets and quickly got, we got a request from, uh, Mary Newell and others involved with the um, poetics for the more than human world. And they had a reading series. And so those went on to our YouTube channel. So it became a place with readings Chacks would sponsor and readings others would sponsor that it, a kind of an open space. And, um, and it's just, you know, been growing. At some point in there, I started doing a podcast of you know, in little 15, 20 minute issues in the history of poetry, the, the, and those are there. And it's, it's a nice, lively space. And I, and I, I hope it, it will continue, although I'm not entirely sure what's going to happen to all the public readings in forums like we're doing right now on Zoom with, uh, you know, as the health situation in America, as it is changing. Uh, but it, it's been very weird that you think you, know, you hate the reasons for why people started doing all these things on computers and, and on online forums. And yet the fact is it has also helped grow the community, help people get to know each other internationally and, and, and nationally and been something pretty exciting. Yeah. Cynthia, what about Technology and painting, technology and your visual work. Has, have there been changes in technological that have enabled things or have constrained things or, or what's your sense of that? Yeah. Well, if you've, if you've been on um, you know, Facebook, I mean, there's so many artists out there who are now showing their work. 
it's incredible and really good work. I mean, thoughtful thinking people spending time with themselves. I mean, there's some really wonderful work. Um, I personally spent the first two years of COVID teaching online painting classes. I taught almost 200 painting classes. Yes, you can teach painting on online. You can absolutely do it. Three hour painting studio classes um, through a group called the Drawing Studio here in Tucson. Um, I didn't know if it would work. I didn't know how it would work. But in some ways, not meeting in a group um, took away all that sort of looking over your shoulder to see what somebody else is doing and, you know, and all that kind of stuff out of it. And people jumped into their own stream much quicker than they do in a regular classroom. It was it was really uh, odd and kind of wonderful. Not everybody, but uh, most of them did. And um, some of those students have taken, you know, over 100 classes with me so far, and they're still hanging in there. And they're really good. They could be teaching classes. Um, you know, so I think in some ways, I mean, I, I was never computer friendly, and I had to get computer friendly fast if I was going to, you know, keep working in, in that capacity as an instructor. And, and uh, if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> That's what I figure. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's been really a powerful tool, you know, really powerful. Mm. Great. Good. Um, well, we're almost to the top of the hour. Um, is there anything anyone wants to add at this point uh, before we segue into a Q and A? I want to just say a bit about the arc of this thing as we head towards 40 years that I, we've been doing kinds of books recently uh, that I never expected, you know, even five, 10 years ago. But it's also, I think, partly due to having been around and having followed certain writers' careers for a long time, so that, you know, a lot of people didn't really know Chax until we recently published, you know, the, the, the selected poems of Rachel Blood Plessy, you know, over 40 years of, of her work. We've recently published both the selected poems and the collected essays of Michael Gottlieb over decades of his work. These are, are challenging kinds of books to publish for their very size and length, and, and also because they are collections of works. I don't always think they lend themselves to that designing from the inside out, I think, because there's many things inside them. but. We've still been able to carry some of that to those bodies of work, and it's been a kind of a, of a of a privilege to meet people and audiences with those kind of books as well. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, and it's it's Norman it, Fisher's collected poems too, or selected poems of, of of a range. I wanted to mention too that Alice Notley in Paris will be doing a Chax reading. Mar is it March 25th? It's this Sunday. No, it's February 26th. <laughs> okay, February 26th. Please yeah. come. Yeah. You can find out about that on the checks.org website. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in, in fact, it's a great website just to find out about not only all of tax activities, but the uh, to go to the YouTube thing or to find out about upcoming events. So, um, good address to keep in mind too. I also want to throw a bone to this group we've worked with for so long as partners in Tucson, the POG or POG, which has presented reading series since 1996. And actually, Cynthia and I were among the founders when we moved back from our brief period in Minneapolis, uh, people wanted us to continue the kinds of readings we had done in the late 80s and early 90s. And we joined with this uh, group of other people in a collective to do that. And so um, I just want to say that because that's they have a great YouTube channel, too. And, <laughs> and uh, it's a big part of our poetry and public lives here. Great. Plus, Good. it's a great place for poets. If you've never been here, you know, look at our website, send us a note. If you want to come read in our series, let uh, us know. 
<laughs> Attention, <laughs> Cynthia Miller. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Great. David, anything you want to add before we Q&A? Um, I think that the the question of uh, community technology, the questions of community technology and and the book uh, that the it seems to all come from the book, but in fact, what what where what impulse does the book come from? So th th this is in a way, forgive me, but it's maybe an obvious thing, but that the uh, Chax in its many, many manifestations, including these ones that are just now being imagined in terms of other kinds of making public, um, sort of restore us to community from the silos where we make our work. And so uh, Chax is just uh, an example of what's really precious to me, why I have, why I'm a bookseller, is that, that these avenues uh, provide that possibility to, to come together. So that's all. Thank you. Thanks. Great to mention. Yeah. Okay. Well, Eleanor, maybe I'll turn it over to you. And if people have comments or would like to add anything or have any questions, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Cole. And a huge thank you to Charles and Cynthia and David for this amazing conversation. It's been so warm and lovely. So thank you. We do have a, a bunch of questions, a few questions from the chat um, from the audience. And our first question is going to be from Evelyn. And Evelyn, you should be able to unmute to ask. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. This was really a great conversation. I was wondering if any of you astute kind of visual text thinkers have any comments on what the ongoing influence or lack of influence has been from concrete poetry. Right now, I'm, um, I'm mentoring a young African-American poet through the Poetry Projects mentor program, and she's doing typewriter-based concrete work, which is really interesting. Uh, but I'm really challenged to think of more recent people doing work like that. You know, Monica de la Torre put out her great anthology of women concrete poets, but still that's pretty historical. And I'm just trying to find ways to maybe tether these traditions together. So I was just wondering if, if uh, people have thoughts on that. Well, I think um, Doug Kearney's books would be a good a good thing to look at just it's I can't get more current um there are also specific anthologies of typewriter art there are two that are not hard to find again the, the, there's a historical basis there but there's a lot of contemporary work in those typewriter art anthologies and um, I can maybe put some information about that into the chat um but I would say that I'm it does seem to me that there there aren't many public sort of venues for that conversation. There have been at times in the past um, when listservs were so uh, active, there was a visual poetry listserv called Spider Tangle, but I don't, maybe that's still going, I don't know actually. Um, but uh, it is difficult. It's always been marginalized, I think. In, in in the United States, maybe more than yes. some yeah. places, more than yeah. some European, to a greater degree. and in Japanese places, it's it's never had a big presence. Um, certainly, this is again, this is historic. But one of the other huge influences on me when I started was um, the work of Carl Jung, and that's Carl with a K and Jung with a Y. Uh, in Milwaukee and Membrane Press and later Light and Dust Books, who was hugely in touch with international uh, visual poetry artists and movements and, you know, did a pretty good job of at least making homes work. But again, not that many people even know who he was and what he did. Well, unfortunately, that Light and Dust archive is still accessible online and is uh wide and deep uh in terms of 
uh, experimental poetry and visual poetry. So again, it's not it's not necessarily current people, although there are, I think, of people like Jim Andrews, uh, people who have uh, worked to try to maintain that community. Um, John Bennett at OSU with the avant garde collection there. Um, but you have to see, you really do have to seek them out. It's not, it's, it, it takes quite a bit of effort. And I, I see there's another note from Jennifer K. Dick about uh, word art, et cetera, in the chat. So um, do check out the chat for these resources. And th thank you very much for those suggestions. Thank you for that question. Um, we have another question um, from Deborah. And Deborah, I will allow you to unmute. Hi, everybody. I'm with you from Boulder, Colorado. And I've, I've always enjoyed pairing my poems with a usually visual art in the way of, you know, I would use one of my own photographs or one of my own drawings or paintings just because the the two practices of seeing uh, with words and, and with pictures seem to uh, complement each other in, in the process. And I'm actually thinking about how I could proceed to create poems and visual art in response to one another myself rather than necessarily with someone else and other than notely are there examples that, that people here know of of people who who have engaged in this process of say creating a poem and then creating visual art to go with it or and vice versa without necessarily without structure saying one must come before the other I don't know that I can answer that, Deborah. And hello. <laughs> um, th th that there are certainly people who have combined their drawings or art, and you mentioned Notley. I think in the early, earlier days of the Lower East Side poetry with Ted Berrigan and Ann Waldman and others, there were projects. But I can't really say for sure that. You know, the art responded to the poetry and the poetry responded to the art and how that collaboration went. Now, David, who handles all kinds of visual books and, and artist books, might be able to speak more to that. Um, I, I <laughs> guess the, the, it, it's difficult to find a, like a single way in because, uh, in a sense, you sort of described the central question for the the kinds of books and the kinds of artistic activity I'm most interested in is all these different uh, sort of solutions that visual artists, writers, or people who do both have found for presenting those things together, uh, whether it's in book form or in uh, in, in other forms, uh, and. Um, I, I kind of, you're in Boulder. I mean, UC Boulder has a great special collections. And I, I think that um, it would be, I can't think of a better way of getting ideas than to look at examples in special collections at UC Boulder of visual books and of illustrated books. Um, I think, it, though it's a really oversimplified uh, picture that you had up until the sort of the middle of the 20th century, uh, a few very sort of tried and true uh, formats for presenting that, at least in terms of commercial publishing, with the way that artists and writers within the French Livre d'Artiste uh, and then in uh, uh, more proletarian kinds of illustrated books but then since, since the mid 20th century, these various styles and traditions, artists and publishers, book artists have been, have taken, as, as with all the other arts, have taken very much liberally from all the different sort of approaches that had been used. And so you, you, you have books that use what would have been thought of as completely incompatible technologies or aesthetics. 
So I think you can find examples of those. I mean, if you were closer, I'd say come to the shop and I'll show you some some books that really are, have surprising ways of of uh, trying to address that question. And, you know, we were talking about Granary before. As a publisher, Granary certainly has, I would I would recommend looking at, at uh, their website and the books they've published because uh, the range of strategies and kind of frameworks within which the visual and the textual come together in those books is extraordinary. So I'd also like to say that uh, Jennifer Dick in the chat pointed to Coracle Press in Ireland. And I would also point to Cuneiform Press in Austin, Texas as exploring that too, including sometimes um, individuals who do both work. I mean, they've published Jim Dine's poetry, for example, and they've done some things with his artwork too. Uh, not necessarily in the same volume, but, uh, but they're- and, and I, I'm sorry. Well, go ahead. I was just gonna mention Printed Matter in New York, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, is an extraordinary resource for artist books. And uh, really the overwhelming majority of those artist books involve text in, in, in a range of ways. There are some purely visual books in there, but most of them are uh, explore that uh, presentation of text and, and an image together. So, I, and they I have just, a great website. I just want to add, you know, Deborah, do it. Just do it. If you're writing and you're painting, just do it. What could be better than that? Well, you're a good example, Cynthia. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a great idea. Bring it back. Yeah. Of course, this question also goes all the way back to, you know, very old 7th, 8th century Chinese poems and calligraphy with the painting on the same page. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's, and, and there are other cultural traditions that combine the two in, in, in those ways, too. Good point. Michael Gottlieb just put in the chat, and William Blake. So real wonderful, <laughs> wonderful uh, work. Well, it, it's interesting to think about how I, I think for us, it's, there's always a kind of tension. Whereas in a, in a, a tradition, the Chinese tradition or Japanese tradition, the, the veneration of the visual uh, appearance of text, calligraphy as one of the great perfections, that we don't have that. So I think that you do find that uh, it, from Blake forward, that, that it's a site of tension and that's an opportunity. I mean, it's a, in a way it's unfortunate, but in another way it's an opportunity because there's always, um, there's always a lot of friction there when those things come together. And you can use that. That's a good point. Thinking about, again, the livre d'artiste tradition in France that you mentioned, David, and how often the image is on one page and the text is on the other, and they are not, as in the Chinese scroll tradition, actually intertwined, right. occupying the same space. So uh, that we do have a sense that there's a bit of oil and water going on. Amazing. Well, that was such a great question. And thank you all for your amazing answers. Um, our final question will come from GE today. Oh, thank you so much, Eleanor. Uh, thank you, panel, um, everyone. Um, can you talk a bit about the Chax Press mission statement? Um, and how it really applies itself to modes of innovation and where that really, where was the impetus to that in the very, very beginning, the, the headwaters? Um, <laughs> and how many different mission statements have we had over the years, I, even though uh, there have been certain things that have been um, central, certainly. Uh, there, there is, we, we kind of have a three-part mission and one of them has to do with our work in creating and publishing books, particularly of innovative writing and in innovative formats. And that's a, 
has fueled us all along. Uh, and then the second part is to also have a, a public presentations um, in those fields. And the final one is to have some work in education for that, whether that means teaching classes, taking on interns. And so in some ways, you know, we've got um, maybe more going on than we can always control and always do all those things at the same time. Um, but that is the mission. And I think uh, it would adequately kind of include almost anything I can imagine doing in books and in teaching about books at this point. I don't know if that fully answers you, GE, but. Yes, it does. And, and, and especially what you were actually following back to what you were saying earlier about taking it to the next step of, of, of incorporating video, film, things like that, and YouTube and everything. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Incredible. Thank you so much for that question, GE. Um, and we, we are now going to have a reading from Charles Alexander to conclude. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to start out with kind of invoking a, a blessing from uh, VP Nickel, who has been mentioned today, uh, because this was definitely something with me in early days of Chax and helps me when I think about all of you, this community. And it's in the book we published called Art Facts, and it's titled Prayer. Teach me song, I would sing. Teach me love, I would, I were open to it. Teach me to pray privately, praise quietly those things I should. Show me the grace of movement and touch, that much I would offer to her. Teach me more. A way for me to reach her who beckons hesitantly. Teach me to be sure. And I'm going to run way back to work in this handmade journal that I had when I began Chax Press and, and that includes work before then and after then. And just on this occasion, these poems have never seen the light of day pretty much, but, uh, but I wanted to today because uh, this is something from early days uh, for me in Tucson, early days of Chax Press and early days with Cynthia. And this is titled El Tiradito, and El Tiradito is a shrine in Tucson, and it literally means the castaway. Things to cast cast a spell, cast a light, cast a ballot, cast a line, what comes up will follow you home. Cast a light, cast away a discarded or rejected person, a sinner, the third in a love triangle, not to be buried in consecrated ground. Cast one's lot with those who care for the living, who care for the dead. They make a shrine in a Mexican neighborhood of small adobe houses. In our homes, we are all castaways. We are all cast together. They make a shrine for the castaway, El Tiradito. Alone, alone and a bone, alone and a bone and a chip, A, B, See, the letters, the sounds are all separate. In utterance, they come together with the shrine. The castaway is not alone. Chips of light for the bones cast a light. More than a hundred candles light away, cast away. Alone we come to place and light a candle for those in need. We come alone, but witness evidence of many, one and others, this place to that, from here to there. We cast a light, 
through the veil. There are those in dark places who need the light, the wish, the candle. We are all alone in a dark place. The flames are for us. Cast a line, cast a light, cast a spell, cast a way. When I was looking at that, that thing about uh, casting something through the veil, I was thinking of maybe that's one thing books do and art does is cast something through that connects to something else. Okay, and now jumping ahead a bunch of years, but to somewhere in the middle of this arc we've gone through from, um, this is from the second volume of Pushing Water, but it's also in a little book by itself. And I'm going to read one section of this work called Some Sentences Look for Some Periods. It seems like only a title a bookmaker and typesetter would pick. Something that mothers and does not know where to go in the night. Or is it morning now? Will you tell me it is morning now so that I might think of the sunlight before the sun is visible, before its letters proclaim the day in heat and light and one sharp motion that might blind or displace the insects from their sleeping places? If I might write just a moment of the day, I might begin with as you wish, your rightness is all, whereas we all know the end is the rest is silence, as in the movie about Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud, as in the words of Hamlet, as if words were in words and sunlight twisted around the letters until lost at the end of day in a graying haze. One upon the string, the G string, the C string, the sing string, to mother to foal, she said, and mother left a year ago, but mother of my children remains and we hold each other in scheduled time on a Sunday morning and in unscheduled time whenever we may please. Does it please you if you please? Pleasure and a lover and what else does one need? Don't forget to breathe on a Friday for this is the day of release. Hold, hold, hold and then let go. One can't build a snowman here unless the climb leads to forests in February if lucky in the open field between the ever green branches. But snowmen are part of my past, once with a red corduroy jacket that my father wore too, or perhaps this is a memory mixture, i.e. the way truth isn't what happened, but an invented memory of what happened. For is and isn't are not divergent, just different sides of a coin whereas different coins might reveal entirely different vistas. From where I sit at this moment, shelves are going out for me, and there upon them one by one, a blue book, an orange book, a black book, a purple book, a silver book, rows and rows of party-colored things made of paper and ink and thread. These are such dreams as stuff is made on. But in the corner, an orange coffee cup and a transportation, not a transmogrification, to a town among mountains with coffee and sunlight and words, 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 no matter, no matter, no water, no wafer, no was, no is. Who am I to call the kettle black, to call you to me for a bright wet kiss on a pillow? In the pillow one sinks and rises, falls and emerges, breathes and stops. A backstop stands behind the catcher. The catcher sits behind home plate. Home plate is buried in the dirt at the corner of the base path. The base path forms a triangle around the pitcher. The pitcher gets things going with a wind up and a pitch to a batter. The batter may be anyone at any given time trying to understand what is given to her, trying to return what the world throws at her, trying to find a way to the fence, to an opening in a fence that might allow more than simply a rearrangement of the parts. Parts are assigned. 
Actor A will play character Q. Amateur volunteer B will play character T. Truth will be evident from the emotional conduct of arms and heads, heads and deads. I am a weary, a weary, I would that I were dead. Deads and beads, those beads that were his eyes, pearls up in my heart of all wonders. I wonder in my bead of all hearts, wander in eyes that curl up and ball up and fall into the time before I was born. I have not come here with empty hands. The lines throughout them will tell you stories of what I have come here with. I have not come here alone, for wherever I go, she and he and she and she and she and she come with me. It is not possible to imagine being alone. No, that game with bases and fences is a team sport, as is the making of snow people, the playing of strings, the rising of the sun in the morning for as long as that may last. To come through conflicts and inventions and waxy worlds and earthquake palaces and hopeful buildings and near acts and random acts and waters pushing, slanting, certain and uncertain and still to float, even to power that floating with strokes of arms and legs with pulses of torsos and unflinching willingness to play the game, even to finish the game despite the rather growing sense that there is no finish, there are no cells that complete the pattern, there may not even be colors one can trust. Some sentences for some periods look and for some periods find naught but ripeness, all the rest is breathing. Plie, c'est l'ampli, the music and the dance, the composer and the choreographer, the chromosome and the coloration, the painter and the poet, the step, 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 and turn, bowls and bowls, holes and holes, mothers and others loose in the night, in the light. And then, and then I'm going to end with a, a short one, which is really brand new. I, I wrote it yesterday and I titled it Pushing Water Four, as though I'm going to write a fourth volume of that book, but I'm not at all sure of that. And I wrote it partly here for this place where I live. Uh, there is no border between here and there. There is no border. But there is a space across which insects make their way, and perhaps javelina and the remnants of rain. A border is a myth or worse, a lie upon which our politicized hopes burn in unnecessary fires. A space instead we might need is a place or the edges of a polis to gather and disperse, contract and release, a place of water a place water is pushed or soon absent, a place, just another place. Why don't I want you here? Why don't you want me here? Hate is a waste of space and time. The green bleeds into the sand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles and Cynthia and David wonderful conversation and just great ideas brought up. And thank you, Eleanor and Chloe and Fong and the whole rail crew for making the space and encouraging this. And thank you all for coming. Yes, thank you so much, Cole, for the excellent questions. And thank you, Charles, for that reading. That was really beautiful. Thank you, Cynthia and David, for your readings as well and for everything that you shared today it's been so special and um, uh, yeah thanks again to everyone who came to listen today uh, we'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSE program and for supporting our archive which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel for the past 22 years the Brooklyn Rail has been a platform for the arts culture and politics through our monthly publication and public events like our daily NSE so please check the chat for a link to donate to support the rail. And if you're free tomorrow, join us at 1 p.m. Eastern time for a conversation with Michelle White and Amanda Gluibitsi on 
given of Walter Di Maria, Boxes for Meaningless Work at the Manila Collection in Houston. And we'll conclude tomorrow with a poetry reading by Jay Gordon Faylor. And now as Israel tradition, you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you everybody. So much. Thank you. Thanks for the great chat too. That was amazing. Thank you.